Welcome to Christ Church. The following is a homily from our Sunday morning gathering in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Enjoy. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. For all their days are full of pain, and their work is a vexation. Even at night, their minds do not rest. I wasn't completely shocked a few moments ago to hear an audible groan from the congregation when that was said out loud. How many of you were a little bit, or a lot, confronted with our lessons today? Mm Mm-hmm. You can raise your hand. It's okay. Yeah, there's a lot more than I thought. I mean, after all, these are some pretty juicy texts that we're reading today, right? This is really heavy stuff. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how we often, many of us who are Marthas, remember that? Find our worth and our our being satisfaction by um, obtaining a task list, and carrying it out, right? We talk about that. Find that worth as a human being. We're taught that we will be successful. We will win if we stay busy and increase our productivity. Well, our text from Ecclesiastes stops us dead in our tracks this morning. Now, this message was written by someone at the end of their life. Someone who has finally realized what is truly important. I don't know if you've ever been with someone at the time of their death. It is a deeply profound experience. And I would venture a guess that the conversations that you have with this loved one are not about jobs or 401ks or cars or houses or things. In my experience, these conversations are deeply, deeply personal and intimate. Think in your head for just a moment of the things that you feel are deeply important in your life. Is anyone brave enough to maybe say something on their list to share? I know this is an Episcopal church, but that's okay. Wife, family, kids, relationship with God. What did you say? Dogs? It's that mask. I can't hear you, Don. Well, don't get me wrong. These things are all very, very important. What you do in your life matters. For instance, one example I came up with, if you are a pediatrician and you treat a child with a fever who doesn't feel well, that is very, very important, right? And we could think of many examples. So remember when, when I continue in a moment that I believe and feel that what we do in our lives matter. However, the busyness of human beings staking our identity in all of these things is where we go wrong. We constantly worry about things. We spend our lives grasping for complete control over the things in our lives. We become consumed with worry to the point that we often lose sight of what truly matters. Well, I could tell you, for me, none of my stress and worrying has impacted any one of the things that I believe are important in life. There are things in our present existence, shocker, that don't matter. They don't matter. It's hard to hear that, but frankly, it's hard to say that because I believe these things matter. But the good news is, is that the temporary nature of all human existence frees you from all of the things that you worry about. Isn't that good news? Those things don't matter. You don't have to worry. Easier said than done. 
Raise your hand if you'd like to be in control of things. I'm seeing some folks that might want to raise their hand. <clears throat> Notice I took a drink right when I had to raise my hand. That was very calculated. <clears throat> Well, this lesson that we read this morning from Ecclesiastes is a strong statement of our complete and total lack of control. This is what Jesus is talking about at the Sermon on the Mount. He says, which one of you can add an hour or a day or a year to your life by worrying? It doesn't work. My friends, here's the good news. You're not in control of anything. Whew. This message this morning calls a spade a spade, and it hits us with the cold, hard, and uncomfortable truth that we are not in control. Then we get to Colossians. And recently we read that Jesus has brought us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Remember that? We talked about that transformation and being made new and becoming a citizen of the kingdom of God. This is a profound description of who you are, who God made you to be. And it gives you permission to be who you were made to be, not solely focus on what you should do. It's already been done for you. That's the good news there. It's already been done for you. Paul tells us to seek the things that are above. Jesus tells us to do the work of the one who sent me, which is to believe in the one whom he sent. The things that are above, this is the gospel. This is the word that you are declared righteous in Christ. And this is the gift of his righteousness for you. This is the word of grace. We are not to focus on the earthly things, the law. Do this in order to be loved. Perform more in order to be worthy. Does that sound familiar? That is our world that we live in. My friends, your life is hidden in Christ. It is not in your resume, your pedigree, your report card, not your achievements, your BMI number, your number of friends or followers on social media. Your life is hidden with Christ in God, and you can rest in that. It's sealed up. It's sewn in. It's a done deal. Christ has you in his grip. Now, what Paul is describing for us is what it looks like continu to continue our journey and our walk with Christ. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And thank goodness for that. And it's an ongoing process. It's going to take your whole life of the Spirit putting to death inside you the things that we are ought not to do, the earthly things. This is knowing you are forgiven and there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Whew. We should make t-shirts for that. Okay, now we get to the Judge Judy portion of Luke's gospel. It's like the people's court, isn't it? Right? This brother says, Jesus, make my brother be fair and give me my share. <clears throat> Once again, Jesus knows what he's doing. He comes to him, using, utilizing and leveraging his holiness as a religious teacher and leader to do the right thing and make things fair. And as we see time and time again, this does not work. It's an age-old story that we still see happening in today's world. Sibling rivalry after the death of a parent. Siblings become enemies. All because of the greed that they hold in their hearts. This man wants more stuff. It's really that simple. But really, don't we all want more stuff? Don't we want more money or more toys? 
But what Jesus is telling them is they need to look way deeper and deep into yourself to find your true motivation for what you want and to be aware of the greed that you are carrying in your life. We're asked to look deeper into what is actually going on inside the human heart. Our possessions become plans by which we are going to save ourselves. And because of this, we become totally obsessed. We probably all know someone who is obsessed with this. We deeply crave the status that goes with these material things. And unfortunately, when these things become your priority, you ultimately never really end up enjoying them. Luckily, these things do not define our lives. Jesus is the one who holds your life. And he holds your life in a way that you cannot. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Till then, remember your place. You are immortal. It's not up to you. Enjoy your food, your work, your cars, your toys, whatever it is that you enjoy. But remember that everything you have is a gift from God. And if you forget that, it's vanity. Apart from Jesus, it is all vanity. Amen. Amen.